wait till February to do that. Then you can you can say. I'm really delighted to be back here with you all today. Oh, I forgot. Thank you. It takes a village, you know. I need all the help I can get. Now, can you hear me? Great. Um, I'm really delighted to be back here with you, and uh, so I guess I ought to get out of the way. The question I've been asked most since it, the Osher catalog came out saying that I was going to teach this particular class, 1910 to 1920, is, well, why did you pick this this uh, decade to focus in on. Why did you not just call it the progressive era? Or what did what what spurned you, what brought you around to deciding to talk about this decade? So I will answer that question by telling you uh, there are probably three reasons. Number one, my parents were both born between 1910 and 1920, and I rather suspect that there are many people in this room whose parents fall into that uh, uh, time period. We have lost that entire generation almost completely. There are a few uh, uh, people around who are 100 plus years old, but not very many of those. And you know, the, the more, the older I suppose I get, I really do give a lot of thought to what was life like for my grandparents, who I knew all four of them quite well, and, and having these children during this time. And I'm particularly curious about World War I and the experience as much as anything because it's been so overshadowed by World War II, and we've really, it has, it's not that it's been forgotten, but it just, because we were in that war for such a short period of time, we just really don't have a lot of information uh, that we, we don't regularly talk about World War I. Uh, the people who you may be associated with who were on the home front during the war, or uh, who uh, were actually fighting in Europe during that war, uh, they're not quite as chronologically close to us as the, the uh, greatest generation, the World War II generation. And so this has is, is intrigued me uh, to think about what was going on um, in, in the United States during this period of time, because when we do get to 1920, it is going to be an explosion of activity. And part of the reason that we have all of this explosion of activity and pent up energy is because we really came out of World War I as, as honestly the only nation who really benefited from the war. We came out, we had been second or third, depending how you look at the world's economies, uh, uh, financially to Great Britain and France before the war, but those countries were devastated they started fighting in 1914. We didn't uh, declare war until early 1917. And by the time our soldiers got to Europe, which was the fall of 1917, we were really only over there for about 14 or 15 months. Whereas in World War II, we were fighting for a long, long period of time. So I'm very interested in uh, this generation, what was going on, how were people living? You know, how do you go from traveling in a buggy to riding in a car? And it is in this decade that the automobile manufacturing business really explodes and really takes off so that by the time World War I ends, people can buy cars. Thank you, Henry Ford. He figured out a way to make them cheaply and faster. And so that, that uh, is an a important development on the scene during this decade. We have lots of other things going on, too. Uh, you will see uh, as we talk through this over the next six weeks. Now, the second reason that I uh, got interested in this is because when teaching Nashville 101, it just dawned on me one day that 
We had more disasters here in Nashville between 1910 and 1920 than I think probably any other decade in our history. It's just one thing after another during this decade right here in Nashville. So I was very interested in that. And then uh, the third reason I chose this topic in this era, uh, to be quite frank with you, I feel like I've said just about all I need to say ever about the Civil War. Uh, you know, we are, we are in the fourth year of the uh, sesquicentennial of the Civil War, and it seems like it's been going on since 1861, so uh, I, I, I felt like that something uh, uh, new might be appropriate for this new year. And then, um, uh, finally, my ulterior motive is, one reason I like to teach these classes so much is because I learn more than I give. There's always a story to be told. Somebody has something right on the tip of their mind right now uh, about some member of their family, somebody who got the Spanish flu, uh, some part of this story, somebody who told you about the reservoir breaking, somebody told you about the Great East Nashville fire. There are connections here, and so during the course of these six weeks, I want to hear your stories. And I am at the end of class going to give you a way to communicate with me, uh, but this is to be a discussion, so feel free. You know, I'm kind of one of these horses that when I get out of the barn, I take off. So feel free to interrupt me at any time uh, and interject any helpful uh, information you may have to the proceedings here. I really do want to hear what your family was doing then. So another title for this uh, six-week course we're having might be From Doomsday to Flappers. Is the world really coming to an end? And the decade does begin with Halley's Comet. And I suppose the, the, the reason we know more about Halley's Comet than probably anything else is because I know that many of you are absolute fans of Mark Twain, and he had pronounced that he was going out when the comet came in in 1910, and certainly he did. Uh, we knew it was coming. Uh, it had been uh, being watched for hundreds of years. We knew what it was. The market for telescopes really picked up that year. Uh, people are out buying telescopes uh, 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 anywhere they can find one to buy. And uh, we finally picked it up about April the 9th of that year. So here comes the comment, and of course the predictions, the hype for this, can you imagine what this would be now? Uh, the, uh, thank, uh, it's not coming again until 2061, so I'm not sure any of us will be here when that happens. But uh, uh, can you imagine the hype uh, that it would be today? Uh, the, the purveyors of doom, it's Armageddon, the world is clearly going to come to an end. Uh, it was a, a, a long anticipated thing, and our president at this time, William Howard Taft, whom I'm sure I saw half of you all before Christmas at the Parnassus uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin event, so I, knew, I know you all have read the book and the Bully Pulpit, which is about Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft and the Muckrakers, an excellent book. Uh, he, he really made William Howard Taft, a re she, Doris Kearns Goodwin, really made William Howard Taft a real person for me uh, for the first time. I enjoyed the book tremendously. Uh, so President Taft was very excited about all of this. He himself went to the Naval Observatory to, so that he could watch this. Uh, the Pope at the time was Pope Pius X, and he, of course, was responding to the folks who were saying, this is the day of judgment that's coming, the world is coming to an end. So he tried to downplay the thing, saying the situation was overblown. But the Earth's orbit is going to pass through the tail of the comet. And so when the tail of the comet was picked up in early April, everybody went crazy. And sure enough, on April the 20th, 
the comet reached the point that it would be closest to the sun, and the next day, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens died. So he, he uh, had, had been accurate about his pre prediction. And sure enough, we survived the apocalypse here. Now, Nashville, at the time Halley's Comet comes through, is a thriving and growing city. It is a booming place. We are on the map in lots of different ways. We've been known for um, a long time as the Athens of the South, at least 75 years by 1910, uh, probably longer. Philip Lindsley, who had come down to be the president of the University of Nashville, had given it that name. It was the leading educational institution in the South until the Civil War came, and then after that, financial uh, troubles uh, eventually caused uh, the University of Nashville, as it was, to close and uh, the, the genuine successor to the University of Nashville is Peabody, right here where we are. Uh, uh, and uh, it was an educational center with lots of colleges, lots of schools, and above all, a tremendous interest in education and a commitment of our citizenry to uh, education. Let me, let me read you something that I found in the Nashville Business Directory uh, from uh, 1912, just at the dawn of this decade. Nashville offers opportunity. The headlines in one of the sections of the city directory told us. Let me read you a little bit about what it says. She is the natural gateway to the South and the South's natural supply point and great market. Nashville has received a great heritage and location. The, to, to the eyes of the capital, brilliant opportunities abound. Its natural advantages are many. Three systems of railroads and the Cumberland River made navigable the year round by an appropriation of $310,000 by Congress. Thank you, Tennessee Congressional Delegation, that year. Uh, give Nashville an easy outlet to the world. The Cumberland Telegraph and Telephone Company, with Nashville as its headquarters, employs over 6,000 people. Isn't that amazing? 6,000 just right here in Middle Tennessee. Uh, One-tenth of this number are citizens in Nashville. This, with the American Telephone Company and two telegraph companies, places Nashville far above other cities in this respect. Nashville's streetcar system is under, unsurpassed for convenience and comfort. Yes, it was unsurpassed, but seven years before this had uh, this was written here in the business directory, uh, we had had a racial crisis here in Nashville when the transit uh, company, the trolley line, decided to segregate its cars from African Americans and a great deal of tension arose, our first racial boycott because African Americans were told they couldn't ride on certain trains and if they could ride on a train they would put an extra car on the back for them. And Nashville's African American community really took a stand then and it was really quite uh, interesting to, to see how far they were able to go with the bus boycott. Indeed, several African-American leaders uh, bought some trolleys themselves, and uh, with this transit strike and this transit boycott, uh, they bought some trolleys themselves and for about a year attempted to operate their own trolley system. So uh, it was, it was uh, unsurpassed, but uh, more blank books, stationery, publishing, and printed matter are made in Nashville than in all other southern states combined. Well, I can believe that, can't you? We big printing place here. We used to be, anyway. Um, 18 banks and financial institutions with a combined capital stock and surplus of over $6 million give Nashville a higher commercial rating than any other southern city except one.
I wonder which one that could be. Uh, the, the, the bank clearings for 2011 were over 20, $231 million. We had three papers, 99 universities, seminaries, colleges, and public schools. Again, ranked second in not just the South in number of educational institutions, but we were second in the entire United States uh, with educational centers uh, uh, around the perimeter of Nashville and in the city itself. This Nashville abounds in public law, railroad, school, and fraternal libraries. Uh, it has the most beautiful parks, many places of amusement, beautiful hotels. The list goes on and on. And insurance is just becoming a business here at the coming of this uh, decade and it is going to really take off the sale of insurance as the Life and Casualty Company and the National Life uh, Insurance Company really have a profound period of dramatic growth uh, with salesmen traveling from here because our transportation system is so good. Now, it's kind of interesting to look, look at some of the things that actually were appearing on our skyline during this decade. I mentioned Henry Ford a little bit earlier, and uh, Henry Ford probably uh, was partly responsible for the fact that the Marathon Automobile Manufacturing Company, the Marathon Motor Works here, did not survive World War I. Um, it had been a, a great idea of many people to put a gasoline engine on a motor. There was a, a company in Jackson, uh, Tennessee, highly uh, well-known and a very profitable company, the Southern Boiler Works, which were making gasoline engines before 1900 for, for boilers, for manufacturing concerns. And one of the engineers there was a man named Henry, William Henry Collier, who was very interested in the idea of putting a gasoline engine on some kind of transportation vehicle. Now he wasn't the only person, there were lots of people all around the world who are attempting to do this. Uh, he just happened to be the one that worked for the Southern Boiler Works. The Southern Boiler Works uh, executives were not really particularly interested in uh, doing this. They really weren't interested in going into the car business. And so they were allowed him to buy the automobile part of the business, which was just coming along. And he designed a car and he started manufacturing the Marathon automobiles. Uh, in 1909, he produced 400 cars. He will move his business to Nashville. He will uh, take an existing uh, manufacturing structure and uh, uh, will uh, adapt it for his manufacturing concern. He made cars here for about four years. The number, the demand for these cars was, was incredibly great. He couldn't produce them as fast as he could sell the cars. He had a great demand for the car, but they were slow. Uh, ma manufacturing the car was slow. And so he finally ended manufacturing financial concerns. Uh, he finally ended in 1914, the year that World War I opened in Europe, and uh, uh, it, it, it never came back. And of course, Henry Ford is right there at this very same period of time. He's looking at this problem from a slightly different point of view. You know, the, the Mr. Collier and the Marathon automobile were trying to make cars one car at a time with an emphasis on quality. And Henry Ford says, we need to figure out a way to make them cheaper so that the average person, not the wealthy, but the average person can afford to buy one of these cars. So how are we going to do this? We're going to have to figure out a way that we can manufacture these cars 
more quickly. And so he came up with the idea of using interchangeable parts. Now that was not, he was not the first person to say interchangeable parts. So one of the gun manufacturers, somebody here can help me with this little fact, uh, uh, before, well before the Civil War, had come up with interchangeable parts for guns. Anybody, know, was it Colt? Winchester? Whitney, Eli Whitney, yes, it's right, it's Eli Whitney, thank you very much, it was Eli Whitney. So he'd come up with this, but Ford is able to apply it to automobiles, and when he applies it to automobiles, he is able to then come, take another step, and put these automobiles on this sort of a conveyor belt of a sort, of the assembly line, and thus the price went steadily down. He didn't try to have a lot of models of cars. He uh, just said black and a Model T will be what we're going to produce, and sure enough, he did that. And that it is when World War I ends, at the end of this decade, that people start buying cars. Of course, as you know, uh, if people are buying cars, they're going to want roads. And that is where they're going to look to the government. They're going to look to the state government. They're going to look to the national government. And they are going to want roads built. Now, uh, it may surprise you to know that there were many people in the Ten Tennessee General Assembly in between 1910 and 1920 who did not want us to spend any state money on roads, or anything else for that matter. But, uh, my, how times have changed, haven't they? Uh, they did not want money spent on roads. And, you know, these, it's amazing to me that these rural farmers would be so opposed to roads because it seemed to me they would benefit from having roads, but they were adamant that the t state did not need to spend this money. They figured it would all be spent in Nashville and Memphis and not in Macon County um, or some other remote place in the state. And uh, they also, I think there's also in Tennessee, in rural Tennessee, you know, I bet there aren't 20% of you all who were born in Nashville, right? I wasn't, I'm, I'll admit it. Uh, there are very few of you who were born here, a few. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, we don't really have any problem here with outsiders, do we? I don't think so. And, and uh, these rural folks, they just as soon you not come to see them. I mean, they don't, they're very wary of strangers, and that really, I think, exists even today in, in some of the more remote parts of the state as you move up on the Cumberland Plateau. So they didn't want us to spend any money on roads. And so with Woodrow Wilson going to the White House in this decade and enjoying riding in a car for afternoon drives, that and golf were his big entertainments, uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, decided that maybe the national government needed to do something about roads. And again, big debate in Congress. And finally, Congress and President Wilson came up with the idea of sharing the cost. And so they passed the first Highways Act during this decade, and the idea is that we will pay half of the cost of a road and the state will pick up the other half of the money. Now let me tell you, Tennessee doesn't really go for that until the 1920s. It's, it's long after the progressive era is over before Tennessee becomes progressive. In the 20s with Austin P becoming governor in 20, well he was sworn in in 23. So um, Tennessee uh, gets, only passes this, uh, their half of the highway bill when the legislators can figure out a way not to have to pay for it. And you know what it is. The gasoline tax, which is earmarked solely for roads. And you know, you may not think our roads are very good, but go up to Kentucky or down to Mississippi, oh, and our, our road tax, our, our taxes, our gasoline taxes go, are earmarked specifically for roads. So uh, people are going to want to get in the car, they're going to want to drive, and this is the decade in which this really takes off. Now, 
Uh, uh, the Nashville skyline is slightly changing. And here's something uh, I, uh, that I did not know until a couple of weeks ago when I found this article in a January 9th newspaper. And by any chance, have you ever heard about this? This is in the January 9th Nashville American, 1910. And it's the little headline of the article is Nashville's first skyscraper. Hey, see, it looks to me like it's got three floors. This is the best picture. <laughs> this is the best picture I could get. But uh, the Stallman Building was the second skyscraper, I, I, uh, as I understand it. But, but it's, it's Nashville's first skyscraper, a building of the city which marks three epochs. Today, yesterday, and way back yonder. Don't you just love it? Way back yonder. I don't know when that was. So we're not really too concerned about the future. We're, we're full of sentiment here. Wonderful combination is the structure. Now look at this. The building is best I can figure out. They, and this is what the newspaper called it. And I think this is what uh, it was called was the City Hall Market House Health Department building. So if any of you, Ophelia, do you know anything about this building? So if any of you know anything, or if you want to be my research assistant, I want to know more about this building, so by all means, uh, let me know. So I assume that this was built down around the public square. We had a courthouse that will be replaced in the 1930s, and I would imagine my guess is that it was north of the square, but I do not know that for a fact. So this was complete news to me, and uh, it was something the city was quite proud of. Now this building to me looks taller than this building. <laughs> This is the Hermitage Hotel, which will open in 1910. And President Taft will come to Nashville and stay at the Hermitage Hotel in 1911. It hosted all sorts of political figures. And its dining room, the Oak Room, which is still down there, very beautifully restored and cared for building, uh, was considered to be Nashville's very best restaurant. and. Uh, at, at the main banquet, when William Howard Taft came in 1911 uh, to Nashville, uh, it, it's interesting to note that they allowed women to attend the dinner. So Woodrow Wilson, the next year, he's governor of New Jersey uh, in 1910, uh, comes to town. Uh, and he also is given a banquet there in his honor. And uh, this was considered uh, really a, a very, very elegant hotel, and it is, is still a beautiful, absolutely beautiful building. And, you know, frankly, we are fortunate that we still have that building because the old Maxwell House, the old Andrew Jackson, the old uh, Noel Hotel, uh, lots of these buildings have long since been gone, but this one is, is now um, under preservation. It's on the National Registry, and we'll keep it for, for the, the, we'll preserve it for the future. Now, suburbs are coming. They're not quite here yet, but they're creeping up on us in 1910. People are beginning to move out. Now, we've had people living over there across the river practically since the city was founded. But, and Edgefield was an elegant, elegant place. Yes, Tish? I've got a wonderful story to tell you about. Oh, please, please, I thank you. Uh, the hotel was originally called Hotel Hermit. I mean, uh, let's see, it's now called the Hermitage. It used to, it was initially called Hotel Hermitage. Okay. And then, because of the war, and so many hotels, this is what they told me at the Hermitage Hotel. Because so, there was so much association about the war in Europe, and most hotels in Europe at that time put the word hotel first, like Hotel George Sank, Hotel mm -hmm. Savoy, right. that the Hermitage Hotel changed it to the Hermitage Hotel instead of the Hotel Hermitage. That is fascinating. That is why I love to teach this class. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And I'm still available for walks in our neighborhood. So, 
<laughs> uh, uh, Tish and I, when we walk together, we walk fast and we talk a lot. So uh, uh, I'm, that's I, very, very interesting. The war did change a lot of things. And, and you know, I, I've just, I'm nearly finished with the biography of Woodrow Wilson that came out last year. It, it was actually uh, getting a lot of attention until the bully pulpit came out. Scott Berg, who wrote that Pulitzer Prize winning uh, biography of Lindbergh, uh, uh, has written a very fine biography of Woodrow Wilson. And uh, it is, is quite interesting how the country responded to World War I, which you really see, and how, how uh, we're trying not to be too German, we're trying to help the the English, maybe, possibly, but there are a lot of Irish in the United States who don't like the English. They just decide soon be on the side of the Germans. We have Germans here in Nashville. Uh, it's quite interesting how all of that uh, takes place and all of that does develop. So here we've got this beautiful hotel. I can imagine downtown Nashville with lights. I can imagine that it is absolutely beautiful uh, to see this and to see all of these buildings. And here come the suburbs. And the, the, we had had, as I said, Edgefield east of the city, but the great barrier in going west was the gulch. And it, it, we had these mule-drawn trolleys uh, that were being used, but the mules just couldn't really pull a trolley down, even though the trolley car would be on tracks, it was hard for them to pull that trolley down and up out of the gulch. So as soon as that kind of gets figured out, how we can put uh, electrical lines there to make the trolleys cross the gulch and we build a viaduct, actually, uh, people are moving out west and they have just begun this at the turn of the century. And, 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 and it's called the Vanderbilt Line because the Methodist Church has uh, picked this piece of property over there um, for, on the other side of Hillsborough Road, um, for uh, Vanderbilt to be, for Central University now Vanderbilt. And so this was a very popular thing to be able now to go out on the west end. So you'll see that Murphy Road area, the Murphy Land Company coming along and they will start developing and then they keep going out west end to uh, where the Free Will Baptist Bible College is, now Welch College, um, there where uh, West End Harding Road intersects Bowling. And um, so this was a great uh, a great moment for development in Nashville. And you see a lot of the same names in all of these companies that are uh, 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 starting trolley lines, starting a telephone company, uh, selling this and that and the other. There were lots of entrepreneurs here in Nashville and the trolley system was one that really benefited from having all of these entrepreneurs here in town. And so the city is going to grow, and that is something we're very proud of. The city is able to begin to expand its uh, city limits a little bit further out around the perimeter, and uh, that people, people, uh, the city is excited about that. Uh, it's a sign that parts of rural parts of the county are now becoming urbanized and they are quite excited uh, to be a part of the city of Nashville. Now our mayor here uh, in, 19, in 1909 uh, did not run for re-election and so in his place a very well-known Nashville politician, furniture store owner, Hillary House, uh, got elected mayor. He was incredibly popular. Uh, there's only one problem here in Davidson County. Uh, he is popular and we're pretty united uh, that we don't really think we need prohibition, but nobody really wants to say they're against prohibition. 
And prohibition has been the moral issue that takes off during this decade. It had, well, it had taken off a couple of years before because Edward Ward Carmack, a former United States senator and now uh, editor, has um, uh, lost an election and he had campaigned on a prohibition platform. He, he was one of these political opportunists. He saw that there were many, many progressive people who thought that prohibition uh, was the right thing to do. I mean, it's sort of one of those things I want everybody else to not drink, uh, but it's okay for me. I can violate the law, but nobody else can. I can speed, but I don't want the rest of you passing me on the highway going faster than I'm going. So there was, there was, prohibition was one of those moral issues that it, it, we should have known better. We should have known that this wasn't going to work. But with Senator Carmack, was uh, shot and he was killed on the streets of Nashville in late 1908. He had run unsuccessfully for governor against Malcolm Patterson and uh, Senator Carmack had been shot and killed and so in memory of him uh, the, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the largest women's organization the state has ever seen, uh, were able to push a statewide prohibition through the state legislature. So Hillary House had been on the side of the candidate that defeated Carmack, Malcolm Patterson, the incumbent uh, governor, and Hillary House had supported him, and uh, they believed that it should be local option, the, the uh, sale of alcohol in the state. But the prohibitionists were able to get statewide prohibition through the entire state uh, by 1910. Now, did that dry up uh, the alcohol <laughs> consumption? No, it really didn't. I mean, some, some historians now are looking at this and saying it was almost um, class warfare, that the wealthy people supported it, but they didn't expect to be deprived of alcohol. They just wanted the poor people. Not The poor people were the only ones with alcohol problems, not uh, the, the wealthy people who wanted uh, uh, to continue drinking whatever they drank, whenever they drank it. So that's how the decade began. And then in 1912, the first of our crises, our disasters happens. Now I know everybody in here knows where, if you, un, unless you just moved here recently, knows where the water reservoir is on 8th Avenue. It, it's really just a great huge, I've got a better picture of it there after it broke, it's just a great huge receptacle for water. It would to hold water so that when uh, we, we can uh, send it out in our water lines, water is always an important function of, of government. And um, this reservoir had been built in 1887. Uh, it was quite a, 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 a big reservoir. Any, I've been up there once years ago, but now it, the security there is very, very high, and I'm not sure... I'm not sure anybody can take anybody up there anymore, but it, it's an open water uh, receptacle is what this thing is. And there had been lots of rumors that the thing was crumbling, that it was leaking. There were leaks all, all over the place, and people just kept saying, oh, it's not going to happen. And of course, then there is the problem of how are you going to pay to fix the thing, and what, what's it cost is always a factor. So here it is, November 1912, and the weather's getting colder, so you don't want to be hit with water uh, at this point. And uh, many people who lived over there east of, of the reservoir wake up that morning very early to the sound of water rushing into their bedrooms. Now can you imagine what this would be like? Uh, it even floated one family out of their house on the beds. 
their beds and all came flowing out of the house. There was a crush of water, heavy granite blocks came smashing through the city. Extensive property damage from all of this that went south or went, went downhill here uh, when the reservoir broke. And amazingly, nobody was killed. And uh, the citizens of Nashville faced a major recovery uh, period. This is going to have to be fixed. And I, as I was reading about this last week, I was reminded of, you know, some people say, especially when we talk about the flood and you're talking to somebody who wasn't here when we had the flood in 2010, people will say, um, well, why didn't you know anything about it? Well, I think part of the reason that our flood didn't make more national news or this didn't make more national news is because Nashville sort of rallied around, the city came together and pulled together and high level of organization took place to help these people and lots and lots of people lost property and home damage and however the city rallied around the folks living over there and uh, they fixed the hole in the reservoir and it is there still. Uh, it, you know, I can only imagine what the spectators were like going to see this. Uh, any of you have anybody ever tell you a story, those of you who've lived here, about, about um, uh, when the reservoir broke? It's an interesting thing. But it is uh, quite, quite, it was quite a large disaster for Nashville. We've had fires by 1912. We've had lots of epidemics of disease. But we've never, and we've had floods. The Cumberland River flooded a lot. That was one way, reason why the legislators were trying to, our congressmen were trying to get uh, the federal government to provide some money for improvements on the Cumberland River. Uh, but we'd never had anything quite like this. And uh, it's actually quite well documented. There are lots and lots of pictures of, of this uh, and, and the reservoir. But it's architecturally quite an interesting place. Um, you know, there's, I, I didn't know this until, oh, maybe last year sometime. All of you, or many of you know, I guess I should say, where Love Circle is. Up on the hill, its most famous uh, resident is uh, John Rich, who built a house up there. The center of that is an underground reservoir, and now since 9-11, there's security fence, and the, it's not a little mini neighborhood park any longer, but there's an underground reservoir, and there's several, several around town. Uh, another interesting aside about water here in Nashville that has happened, water, Nashville has, as a city, taken great pride since well before the Civil War in its water system, its uh, lines, its uh, methods of taking the water from the Cumberland River, the filtration system that a Nashvillian developed so that literally gravel and sand could be used to s filter uh, the water to a very high degree, high effectively. And it really wasn't until right before 1910 that we really started adding chemicals to our water to treat the water. Uh, people trusted their water a lot better uh, uh, than we trust our water today without it being uh, treated and purified. And so with uh, this purification process becoming more extensive and more expansive, at the end of this decade in 1920, uh, the city will make a decision to put uh, uh, chlorine in the water and uh, replacing one of the lime products that it used. Uh, if you haven't been out to the Omahundra water treatment plant, uh, it really is one of the most interesting and beautiful places uh, in Davidson County. And some of you, I think, went out there with me a couple of years ago. And it makes you feel good about what the water that comes out of your tap. I'm, I, the water department here does a very good job in providing us uh, water. So that's um, uh, something 
that we should be proud of. So the United States enters World War I, and I'm going to devote a couple of classes here to talking about World War I. Today I'm just trying to kind of give you an overview of, of what was going on here. But in, in 1916, we have yet another catastrophe. This is in the middle of the war in Europe, but the United States is remaining neutral. The United States has steadfastly stayed out of this war in Europe. We have managed to stay out of other conflicts in Europe, and we are staying out of this one. And in the middle of the war, a fire begins in East Nashville. Early morning on March the 6th, uh, March 22nd, 1916, over the course of a couple of days, over 500 homes, numerous businesses were burned to the ground, leaving 2,500 people in East Nashville completely homeless. Now, you've all heard the story of the the Chicago fire where somebody's cow kicked over the, the, the lantern in the barn and the half of Chicago burned. Well, this was, was not exactly that kind of fire, but it was started by something that we don't really give a lot of, of thought to, but it had happened, there had been a New York fire in 1911 at the Triangle Shirt Factory that had taken lots and lots of lives, and uh, it was the same thing. We had a mill located over in East Nashville on North First Street, the Seagraves Mill, and living next to it was Joe Jennings. Joe Jennings' house caught on fire because uh, there was uh, lint coming from that textile mill in the neighborhood, and some of the lint caught on fire, and then they were not able to put the, si the fire out. And amazingly, there was only one catastrophe in this. There were several people in in injured, and the one fatality was a man who was actually electrocuted when a power line came down. But we had high wind creating just the perfect storm here for a fire of this magnitude. Uh, the houses, many of those East Nashville houses had wooden shingles, and uh, the fire spread very, very rapidly, and uh, the city fire department rushed in, uh, but they simply couldn't put the fire out with the wind blowing so, so badly. Uh, residents themselves in East Nashville formed bucket brigades. They were doing everything they could. Uh, the fire marshal of Nashville was, was telegraphing every city around Middle Tennessee saying, please, please send help for us. We need, need help. Finally, Governor Tom Rye uh, mobilized the national, the state guard, and the state guard came in and assisted with some of the rescue work. But there were lots of public buildings as well as homes burned. Uh, this is the convent of the Little Sisters of the Poor. Uh, they were a charitable concern uh, of the diocese, the Catholic Diocese of Nashville. Uh, as you can see, it was heavily damaged. The Tulip Street Methodist Church, the Woodland Street Presbyterian Church, Warner Public School, uh, uh, many, many of these buildings burned to the ground in uh, this uh, terrible, terrible fire. And it was said that across the river in Nashville, you could see this blaze, this horrendous blaze across the river. It must have been quite frightening to everybody concerned. So people, people are, are very much, again, trying to rally together and deal with this. But Americans and Nashvilleans are also becoming very, very, uh, uh, I, I guess maybe the term would be fatalistic. They think that we are going to get in this war. They think that we cannot stay out of World War I much longer. We're being pressured by both sides. Uh, our president, Woodrow Wilson, is agonizing, absolutely agonizing, uh, trying to keep our country out of the war. He had, had really been distressed when uh, early in his presidency uh, some American soldiers had gone down to the 
border between the United States and Mexico and some American soldiers had been killed and it really bothered him and so he was uh, valiantly trying to keep us out of war but at the same time you've got lots of voices out there to be heard. Um, some would call the people who wanted us involved in this war jingos. Uh, one of the leading critics of Woodrow Wilson was Theodore Roosevelt. He very much wanted the United States in the war and lots of other people. He wasn't just TR. There were a lot of people who really felt the United States really needed to get involved in that war. So Nashville really uh, uh, is, is braced for this. Uh, Woodrow Wilson ran for re-election in 1916. Uh, he is elected by a relatively narrow margin. There were about three days before we really knew who was going to win that election, what was going to actually happen. And uh, Woodrow, when the California votes finally came in, Woodrow Wilson was declared the victor over his Republican rival, uh, Charles Evans Hughes, who uh, was a chief justice, well, not a chief justice, but a justice of the United States Supreme Court who resigned from the Supreme Court to run for president. And there's William Howard Taft, who really his ambition in life was to be a justice of the Supreme Court. He had the legal temperament, not the political temperament. And, and uh, he had become president of the United States, so here is a justice who wants to be president. And, and Will, William Howard Taft will be appointed to the Supreme Court by Warren G. Harding. So, uh, in spite of our country's best efforts to stay out of this war, uh, as the war goes on and the hundreds of thousands of soldiers are dying, I mean, it is a total gridlock. It is an impasse. The Allies are not really able to push. Neither side is able to push uh, back and it just, con the numbers of some of these battles, the Somme, the Dardanelles, it is, it is shocking to us to read this in our papers here in Tennessee of how many Europeans are dying. Some Americans had actually gone and enlisted in the British Army uh, to be able to participate in this. So after, uh, after a lot of agony over this, the United States... President Wilson goes to Congress and Congress will declare war against Germany, getting the United States involved in uh, World War I. And uh, the United States pulls together. Uh, President Wilson himself is highly organized. He's thought out how the war effort needs to be organized. Uh, Congress will pass the Selective Service Act. We'll have a draft. A hundred thousand Tennesseans uh, will, will enlist on their own. A hundred thousand Tennesseans will enlist in the Army. Uh, and, and, and one who was drafted is sort of the face of World War I, I feel like, for Tennessee, Alvin York. And Alvin York's exploits, which have been immortalized in film during World War II, have sort of overshadowed a lot of the other contributions that Tennesseans uh, made to winning the war. Tennessee had six winners of the Congressional Medal of Honor in addition to Alvin York. And uh, Tennesseans did play a, 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 a significant role, but they didn't really arrive in Europe until 1918. So we were there comparatively short. And even though we have a lot of young men going to war, it was nothing like World War I, when, World War II, when every young man who was able was going to war. So it is... Uh, during this period of time with, with the United States entering the war that the national government decides there's been some, you know, wars unfortunately bring out all sorts of technology. And, and you know, medical practices uh, are generally about 
they're fighting, medical practices are the practices that were developed in the last war, and we've got technology always a step ahead of the science of medicine. And this was certainly the case uh, during World War I. And so uh, a, a kind of gunpowder that will not produce smoke has been developed. And the government decides to locate a plant to make this smokeless gunpowder in Davidson County. And they, 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 again, I think we probably have our congressional delegation to thank for this because the politicians were always trying to get uh, government money in their district. And uh, the plant is going to be built in a bend of the Cumberland River that is very difficult to reach. There's a nice bend over in Old Hickory. And so thus the town of Old Hickory, the community appears uh, uh, in, in just a matter of months. Uh, there was another gunpowder plant built down in the Muscle Shoals area, in the Huntsville area, about the same time. But of course for us this means lots and lots of jobs of folks working in the war effort. And we have lots of young women from rural families coming into town to take a job at this powder plant. We'll talk about this, uh, uh, we'll talk about Luke Lee uh, next time. Uh, but uh, we have people coming to work at this powder plant and uh, they are, the, many of these young men and young women lived in the YMCA or the YWCA. The YWCA uh, had been finished, the new building uh, had been finished uh, in 1910 and it was operating by 1918 at full capacity. But uh, you've got all these people coming in living close together. And there were a lot of day workers who went to uh, Old Hickory. They would come from Dixon and even further west than Dixon, but they would take the train into Nashville for these jobs at the powder plant. And so it was on July 9th that there was a, a signal crossing an outbound train leaving the city and an inbound train coming into the city full of workers for the powder plant collided and it was a terrible, terrible catastrophe. Uh, the worst railroad accident in uh, American history. Uh, and let me, I'll tell you a few facts about this. Local train number four left Nashville headed west on the same track as the Memphis Atlanta number one express train headed into town. Uh, nobody knows today what exactly caused the misstep, what happened. Since the express was running about 30 minutes behind signal, uh, it could be that the engineer thought he could beat the other train. Uh, we don't know what happened, but he, uh, the, the engineers had been given the all clear signal and they start coming into town. Maybe they didn't see a, a red light that had been flashed for them. We just don't know. But this takes place in Dutchman's Curve, just outside of the city, in Bell Mead. And if you walk the Warner, uh, walk the uh, Richland Creek uh, Greenway, you see this memorial there every time you walk. Now, I know that Rick Rowell over there has a Dutchman's Curve story uh, of, of your family. It was your grandfather? My grandfather. And he was, what was he doing? He was on the he was on the outbound train. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting. So I'm sure that the rest of you have some some Dutchman's curve stories as well. 
about this and how it happened, but 121 people were killed. And again, I'm sure the people from Nashville just could not believe their eyes when they went out to see the damage. And uh, they, the trains were probably going 50 miles an hour, which is an incredibly high speed. Yes? Nothing on Dutchman's curve, but um, I did a history on, uh, on um, du DuPont contracted, was contracted by the, by the government to, to right. make that Right. It was the DuPont powder plant. The DuPont mm -hmm. powder plant. But I'm almost sure uh, that they never got to the point uh, of making any powder. They hired all those workers, but as you mentioned, that war ended so doggone fast, they never did any work. And that's a very good point. If they made any gunpowder at all, it was very short-lived, because by the time they got the plant built, the DuPont plant, the war was over. And uh, they, there, there were, DuPont continued running that plant, and Rayon City, uh, they started making rayon after the war. They converted it very quickly. And, and I really think that if you have not ever been to Old Hickory, which isn't that far, you ought to go out there. It really is an interesting community within our urbanized Nashville because it was a company town. Uh, the DuPont Company built the Old Hickory Country Club. The DuPont Company uh, built houses uh, for the workers. If you were in management, you had a big house. If you were uh, lesser down, your house reflected your position working for uh, DuPont there. Uh, I am told that if you, as a child, misbehaved at school, the uh, uh, principal would have no trouble correcting your problem because the principal would go straight to your dad's foreman at DuPont and uh, you would never uh, act up again at school. <laughs> that, du that, that's, that's what I've been told. So I don't know, I don't know whether, uh, how many people uh, might have lost their job. I doubt they were did. But still, it was a highly uh, knitted community DuPont offered barbershops. It was just like the Pullman uh, uh, community in Illinois. Well, the village was called DuPontonia. Yes, it was. It was called DuPontonia. And uh, DuPontonia also then became uh, Lakeland, right? Isn't that right? Lakewood. Lakewood, Lake yes. And uh, they have now surrendered their charter. But um, uh, at the time of, of this accident, it was uh, just horrendously difficult for the DuPont company. Uh, and, you know, it, it's kind of the one-two whammy here. I mean, you've got this horrible train wreck in the summer, and then the Spanish flu starts coming. And you've got all sorts of people uh, uh, coming down with the flu, and it is absolutely terrorizing every person in America once it is fully understood that it's an epidemic. And I would imagine that lots of your family trees have people on those trees who uh, died of the Spanish flu. And it was a particularly uh, difficult disease to understand because it seemed to hit people in their prime of life rather than the children and the oldest segment of society. So it was a devastating thing for this, for this, for this to happen. And uh, uh, it was uh, totally uh, uh, distressing for us. There are some of the little DuPont houses. They've become rehabilitated, and they're very, they occasionally will have a tour out there uh, in the spring. And they're very charming houses that have been rehabilitated out there. And it, it's very much, there's still a very uh, good sense of community there. But it was the Spanish flu that really, of all of these catastrophes that took place, it was the Spanish flu that really seemed to, to, to break us up more than anything else. It was, it was so 
uh, uh, devastating to see your neighbors dying, to see how quickly people got sick, to see the hospitals not able to accommodate the patients and people not knowing what to do. And uh, there were a couple of months when the death toll here was very, very high. And of course, out there at DuPont, with people living close together and being around each other, it was just the perfect place for uh, germs to uh, uh, be spread. So this is really the note on which this decade ends, uh, this, this flu epidemic. And people now have money. They see all these ideas that have come during this decade. And so when 1920 comes around, they want no more progressivism, no more idealism. We want to just be shoppers. Advertising had been around forever, but advertising is going to really, really take off. And with advertisements, uh, we are going to become a consumer nation like we had never been before. And so all of these changes will be in the works and sort of uh, percolating, as it were, 1910 to 1920, and then when the 20s take off, it's really fasten your seatbelt because uh, it's going to be a wild and woolly ride through the 20s. And of course, you know, we like to think of the 20s as being a decade when everybody was free and having a good time, but people were scared. People were really nervous. Change coming too quickly. None of us like change coming quickly, and that was what the end of this decade brought. Too many changes in too short a period of time, and the economy's expansion. Now, that's where we're going to stop today. So I have saved some time to answer any questions or hear some comments. So I will try to repeat the question since I'm the one with the mic. Viv. Why was it called the Spanish flu? Ah, good question. They think that it originated in Madrid. Uh, and it had spread, the, the way that it really spread and the way it got here was military camps. It came with soldiers. Uh, it came into, I think, a military base, a fort in Kansas. Philadelphia had a horrendous uh, experience with the Spanish flu, and I am going to talk a lot about that uh, in about three weeks, but it, it was called the Spanish flu because they believe it originated in Spain. Who knows? I think the king of Spain might have gotten the flu and, and, and lived, lived through it, but lots of people died very quickly. Yes, Sue, did you have a question? Okay, somebody had a hand up. Where, where, where? Oh, yes, yeah, okay, was Tracy. There, was, there, was there a connection between the flu and the advertising? Or did, was, did, oh, no, I just, that's it. just kind of, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Was there a connection between the flu and the advertising? No. Uh, uh, we were advertising, uh, you know, we'd, we'd started buying lots of stuff long before 1900. I mean, if you read those newspapers, if you look at them, I love to look at them because they're so full of patent medicines. And you know, this, this until Theodore Roosevelt and his Congress got the Pure Food and Drug Act passed, uh, you know, you'd, we'd buy anything, you know? Uh, Julie, are your nerves bothering you, honey? Well, here is Miss Lydia Pinkham's nerve powder for you. And you know, uh, we, we sent, uh, they were called drummers in those days, but people out on, out on our massive transportation system out in the hinterlands to sell these uh, drugs. And people bought that stuff. I mean, we still buy all this stuff. Goodness gracious, we're buying stuff all the time. And so now, now we've got the Pure Food and Drug Act. And, and, and you know, the, I will talk at some point about the history of aspirin just because this kind of takes a place. It gets into our history in, during this decade. And uh, aspirin was the wonder drug, and we couldn't get it. It was originated in Germany, and we couldn't get it. And so uh, when the war started, so we started our own business. Yes? 
Well, you know, that is really a very good question. There were several hundred people in Davidson County killed, and I will, bring the st I will get the statistics for you about that. There were more people in the United States that died from the Spanish flu than died during, th that were killed in the war. But we were there just such a short period of time, relatively speaking. I mean, you know, you've watched Downton Abbey, admit it. Um, uh, 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 we, uh, you know, we did not have the devastation that Europe had, families uh, being, uh, 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 losing so many, this whole generation of young British men, young French men, young Germans, uh, Italians, Russians, they're gone. And the last thing they want is another war. So that's a great, great tragedy of all of this. Any other? Yes, sir. Well, our recruits were isolated, were concentrated in training camps, and that's why. Yeah, that's right. You're in a training camp, and the germs just through, go through the barracks like crazy. Yeah, that's, that's why more young men died in a flu than in the war. And I'm sure that's really one reason why the YMCA and the YWCA had pretty high fatalities because you have people Some living. Some of those camps were actually isolated. They would close the gates and yeah. nobody could go in, nobody could go out. And they were trying to quarantine massive parts of Philadelphia uh, as well. Well, we've got a lot to talk about over the next five weeks. Now, 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 let me tell you, here's my, your homework should you choose to do it. <laughs> If you have any stories, we'll end with women getting the right to vote. Now there's a tale, a tall tale. Um, if you have any stories you want to tell, and I will save the customs houses, plural, for a, uh, another day. It's, it's too good a story to give short change to. If you have a story, or if you have a question, or something you want me to talk about, uh, you will send me an email. Yes? Yes, if you do. And the email address, let me get through all these pictures, which some of these are really quite interesting. Well, I've lost my thing. Uh, you will send me an email with your question, what you really want to know something about, or uh, some story you want to tell me, to carol, with an E on the end of it, dot B-U-C-Y, at Nashville dot gov. You can send it to my Vol State email address too. Betty? You gave us a little tease at the beginning by saying that Nashville was in the second city. Atlanta. They were zooming, they were zooming ahead. But, uh, and well, thank you very much for your attention. You know, that's, I will look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye. Oh, it's a... Uh...